are you this fine and really actually quite dark evening. I hope you're doing really well. My name's Christine and it's my delight to welcome you. Tonight we're going to be talking all about building engaging presentations, which is actually one of the hardest sessions we run as trainers because of course we're going to be telling, I'm going to be talking to you about all the things that you should be doing when you're presenting and you'll be able to see whether I am doing all of those things. So as I say, my name's Christine and I'm one of the trainers here on Google's free skills training program, the Google Digital Garage. A um, little bit about myself, I guess. I'm not what you would call a natural presenter, or I never thought I was. Um, for the first probably 10 years of my career, I was petrified of presenting. Absolutely petrified. I would literally get the shakes before I went, had to stand up on a stage and talk about something. And I always thought that presenting was one of those things that you either could do or you couldn't, that you were born with it, that it was natural or it was very, very unnatural. And I'm really glad to say that I was wrong um, because like anything else, presenting and delivering and building pre presentations are things that can be learned. They are things that can be improved on. So no matter how you start, they can get a lot better. And hopefully you'll see tonight that I will happily chat on to any group of people now. Um, so I hope that um, you, as I say, learn a little from this evening, but it, you're not going to get, it's not like some of our um, broadcasts where, you know, you're going to get all the answers in the session. Lots of hopefully homework for you to go away, tools for you to try, um, just, just ways that you can continue to develop your presenting and your presentation skills. Um, so alongside me this evening, I've got our lovely uh, Tessa. Tessa's our, I'm, I'm going to be your trainer. Tessa's going to be the moderator. Tessa is in the chat right now. If you are browsing signed into YouTube, you should be able to see that there's a chat functionality. And in there you will find uh, the lovely Tessa Google Digital Garage. And Tessa will be able to answer your questions as we go through. You can ask a question. She might ask you some of her own. She'll be gathering feedback. Basically, if when I'm presenting, and this is one of the things we might talk about, if I'm presenting to you online, I can't also be typing in the chat. So we work as a team and Tessa is in there to keep everything moving. She'll send me some of the questions that she thinks would be great for the whole group to hear. She'll answer some as we go and then she'll give me some of those questions so that towards the end, I'll be able to hopefully do a little bit of live Q&A with you. So if you have any trouble um, and, and want to get involved in that chat, rather, you don't have to have trouble to get involved in the chat. If you want to get involved in the chat, you need to be signed into a YouTube account. If you're not signed in at the moment, then just pop over up on the top right hand side there, sign up or sign in to your YouTube account and um, then you'll be able to join in the live chat with us. We are broadcasting live on YouTube, which means that to join in with the live chat, you have to stay live with me. Broadcasting on YouTube live means we could pause the videos as we go. Um, but if you do that in order to make notes or what have you, then you're going to lose out on that chat, chat opportunity. So top tip is to watch the video right through with me now, watch the broadcast all the way through. And if there's something you think, aha, yes, that's it, Christine, that's what I need to do jot down the time code, pop the time code in. You'll be able to then rewatch this video till about lunchtime tomorrow. So you've got plenty of time. Go get a cup of tea and rewatch any sections you want to. Any problems you have viewing the webinar, best thing to do is just refresh it. Little bit of turn it on again and off again seems to work wonders. And we are running this Google Digital Garage virtual training as part of our broader offering of courses. So if you want to check out the schedule of upcoming webinars, then see the information on the description below, link you through to our website, and you'll be able to see what else is coming up. So today we're going to be helping you with three different things. First of all, we're going to think about how your approach to your presentation. How are you going to craft it? How are you going to tell the story that you want to tell. Then we'll take um, a look at some of the ways that you can use. We're going to, uh, to actually build a set of slides. So similar to the one I've got here, we've got a set of slides. I've used a tool. Well, I didn't build it myself. We had people to do that for us. But this, these slides have been built um, in a program called Google Slides. So I'm going to take you through uh, some of the ways you can use that particular tool. It's very similar to lots of tools out there. We'll have a bit of a talk about some of the other tools as well. And then my favourite section of any 
um, broadcast or any training that we do here on Google's Digital Garage. And that's when we start to think about how you actually go out and deliver your presentation, how you live your presentation, how you really improve those um, skills to make yourself a better, more confident, more coherent presenter. Um, so hopefully we'll spend as much time on that section as we can. And of course, please do be asking questions, making comments. It gets very lonely here if nobody sends us any messages. So do send um, our Tessa some of your comments and questions as we go through and she will keep those doing. If you haven't already, pop into the chat, find out where it is, say hi to Tessa, and maybe let her know why it is you joined us this evening. Because the more we know about you, the better we can craft our sessions to what you need. OK, so let's start with um, starting to think about and understand how you can craft a presentation to engage your audience. And before we do that, I want you to just take um, a moment to understand your audience. As I, I might have mentioned, I'm a marketeer by trade. I have spent my whole career obsessing about an audience. Now, for that might be the audience for a business, for a product, for a service. But when you're delivering a presentation, quite often you are marketing something. So a presentation, the great thing about presentations when you're delivering um, is, is you get to craft a story. You get to be a bit more human with what, uh, how you're going to present some information. Because normally when we are presenting, we are presenting to um, inform somebody of something. We want to bring them round to our way of thinking and uh, persuade them of something, motivate something. You want to teach them something, maybe. It's all about connection on a human level, which is, as I say, for me, what marketing is all about. So it's about being able to bring through personality, to bring through connection, to bring through humanity and, and bring whatever subject you're trying to inform or persuade or teach about to life. Um, it brings it off, you know, you could write everything down and hand it to somebody and expect them to take everything in. You could give them a spreadsheet or a project plan with all the facts in it, but a presentation is about really bringing those things to life, okay? But because... So with, with, with a document, you get to control everything in advance, pop everything down, control it. This is how I want it to look. This is how I want it to go. With um, a presentation, people can get a bit uncomfortable with that because we're in, you know, we are uh, uh, introducing an element of surprise. People can feel a bit exposed, a bit unnerved by what might happen in that room. So we'll, towards the end, we're going to talk about ways that you can, well, no, all the way through, ways that you can almost control some of those things, that you can make sure that you give yourself the best chance to tell that story coherently to inform or persuade or teach somebody. Lots of different ways we can go about that. So let's look at some of those factors that are going to be key to making a good presentation. All right. So... I want you to think about your audience rather than thinking about what the message that you want to convey. Think about the audience and how are they going to receive those messages? Who are you speaking to? You know, why are they there? I've asked you already, actually, haven't I? Why are you here today? The, you know, um, it's great to start to understand a little about your audience. Um, so, yeah, how will you, a bit of research on them beforehand. Our presentations here at Google Digital Garage are a little bit out of the ordinary because we, our mission is to train as many people as we can with digital skills, which means we don't know really who in advance is going to come to our sessions. But hopefully when you deliver a presentation, you might have more of an idea of who the people are. You know, you might want to think the kind of person they are, what are their education levels, what languages do they speak, where are they located, what presentation, um, you know, the, the kind of almost facts or demographics about your audience can really help. Think about why they chose to, in, you know, join you for your presentation. Did they even choose to join you? 
I've run some sessions recently with with younger people, with a younger audience, and it's kind of they've kind of been told they had to come to it. They were in education and working out where they were going next, and they were kind of told they had to be there. It's very different to motive, try and motivate somebody and interest somebody who is told they have to be there. Whereas if somebody chooses to be there, it's a very different um, it's a very different approach you might take. And what level of understanding do these people already have? You'll, you might be an expert in your subject, easily able to converse at a level with other people who understand it. But sometimes we're going to need to be teaching people who don't understand it so much. So how can you make it as easy and pitch it at the right level? There again, this evening, I don't know whether you've done 100 presentations or whether you're considering your first. So what I'm going to try to do tonight is, is give everybody something they can go away with and work on to improve. Um, and then you want to be thinking about, you know, the sorts of things like how much time have they got? How, how important is what you're talking about to them? It might be the most important thing in your world, but it might be a very small part of the day. So how are you going to use the, all of those little bits of knowledge to, you know, to, to craft something that they are going to want to stay awake for? Things you can do is think about, you know, when you have uh, understand what their, we say it here, their pain points are. What is it that's going to make them sit up and take notice? What's going on in their world? The more you know about them, you can really start to craft what you say to really touch a nerve with them. If you can present them with the, the solution to the biggest problem they've got, then you're really going to get their in, in, um, interest and their engagement. Um, and, and also think about, you know, how for different people's needs, accessibility. Um, there's there's different kinds of different kinds of needs that people have. I've already mentioned what language do they speak. You know, if I put up a, a, a slide with lots and lots of text on it, that might make it difficult for people who maybe aren't natural readers or speak a different language, or for all kinds of reasons, can't just read the text on the slide, which is another reason to present rather than to present to give a, a document. But you might think that your doc your presentation looks beautiful but is it actually easy for somebody to read is it easy for somebody to see is it easy for somebody to get to that's why I loved um, being able to switch to broadcasting when we went and we took all our training sessions we took a lot of training online it means it's a lot more accessible accessible to all kinds of people um, you know you might have uh, uh, different physical um accessibility needs, but also different neurodiversity needs. So think about the different kinds of people who might be coming to your session and, and what it is that they are going to need. We've, we've got some pointers on those sorts of things as well. So we said about, um, you know, making sure you tailor what you say to different levels of, uh, to the different audience, the different levels. Wherever you can, be as clear as you can. So avoid jargon if it's not going to be understood by your audience. Remember that the point of your presentation is not to make you sound super clever. It, it should be to make that person feel clever themselves, feel well informed, feel comfortable with the subject. So only use appropriate jargon. You know, if you're talking to people who are also experts in the field, use the language they would expect to hear. It gives you the credibility but to be as clear and concise as you can. You want to get to the point in the shortest possible time. And only include relevant information. So one way of staying concise is actually to say a bit less. Don't tell them a hundred things when there are only 10 that they need to know. Um, making that content really easy to understand, even for experts, it just means it's, the easier it is for them to understand it, the more likely they are to stay switched on during your presentation. Um, and reduce the amount of text you use. Even if somebody is a brilliant native language reader, if you put lots of words upon your slide, they're going to spend time reading those words and not listening to you and not understanding. So try and have fewer words, less text. Give the words that you have, only choose the important words on the slide and really give those a bit of space to breathe. Give, make it that those key points do stand out.
stuff. So I've mentioned a couple of times already that presentations are an amazing uh, chance to tell a story. As humans, since we all sat around a fire deciding what shape we were going to make the wheel, we have communicated through stories. Stories open up bare facts. Stories bring your audience along with you. And there's different kinds of story that you might want to tell. So the first kind of story to consider is a journey, a hero's journey. It's classic storytelling. Um, and it was actually popularised by Joseph Campbell. It follows a single protagonist, your hero, through a series of challenges, through some transformations. You walk through the story with your main character, with your hero. And when you incorporate this kind of structure into your presentation, you can create anticipation, you can create engagement, maybe even enjoyment, you know, and the audience follows through the progress of your hero. Um, if that hero struggles, the audience can empathise with that, especially if the struggles you choose are ones that they are feeling themselves. And as they triumph, they're going to bring those emotions along with them as well. Um, and it builds empathy and it, as I say, helps to open up that, um, it, open up the facts, the bare facts that you're trying to say in such a way that they really relate to that person. And another type of story is a kind of problem versus solution, a problem solution narrative. So with this kind of structure, you're going to begin by presenting a relatable problem or challenge, something that your audience thinks, oh, yeah, I can, you know, I can relate to that. One reason when I'm starting is I, I openly talk about, you know, the problem I used to have, which is that I, I was nervous of presenting, desperately nervous of presenting. I'm opening that up, presenting that problem that should be relatable to lots of people who come to this presentation skills training is because that's something they struggle with. And then what you start to do is introduce some solutions, introduce some ideas that can address that problem effectively by knowing and understanding your audience, by exposing those pain points. You get to build empathy with your audience and show them the solutions and hopefully persuade them that the way that you want to take them is going to be a good way for them. Which kind of ties in with the third version, which is a personal anecdote. So when you are building your stories, building your presentations, personal anecdotes can be a really powerful way to connect, connect on an emotional level with your audience. All too often we see people standing at the front and we think, oh, gosh, they, it looks so easy to them. They look so perfect. How could I ever hope to do anything like that? But by recounting your own experiences, you build your credibility, you build empathy with the audience, and they really might start to think, OK, I can relate to this person. I might like this person. I might understand where they're coming from and feel like they understand me as well, which there again opens up the humanity of it. And they're um, able to jump in and see the authenticity and relevance of the messages you've got to tell them. And something that um, it is really useful, actually, is, especially when we're dealing with facts, to try and unlock some of the less rational, the more emotional sides of us as human beings. So an emotional arc, the shape of it, refers to deliberately progressing your audience through a set of emotions. Um, so maybe you want to start by capturing the audience's attention grab their curiosity, give them something to be interested in. Then you might build some anticipation, build some drama, add some tension, maybe some conflict. Maybe there's several different ways they could go. And how are you going to get the emotions involved so they help to start to understand that, you know, there's lots of different ways we could go, but I'm going to use emotions to show that my way is the way they should go. Um, and so as you navigate through that story, you're building empathy, you're highlighting the emotion impact. Maybe it's on individuals, maybe it's on communities. Um, charities can use this really well when they are, you know, they're telling the story and they go straight to telling the story of the beneficiaries. And it's when the emotion is at the highest that people are most likely to donate. So don't be afraid of using that humanity to your advantage. 
and make sure that because it's an arc, you're going to take them on this journey and, and take them through a bunch of emotions. Make sure you make you resolve it. Make sure that you tie it up at the end to something that maybe gives them inspiration, gives them the impetus to go and do something, gives them a lasting impression that they really did feel the things you were wanting them to feel. And finally, you might want to add a surprise twist. As, uh, adding an unexpected twist to your presentation story can um, generate excitement, generate anticipation. It can really shock people out of what they thought they were getting and send them off in a different direction, which can really make them think. Um, and, and it keeps people engaged and it can keep them on their toes, really, and maybe make that presentation a little more memorable. So you've got lots of elements you could use there. We're not saying use all of them, but think about how you're going to tell your story. Don't think of just delivering a presentation. I want you to really think of crafting a story as you go. And um, the more memorable your story can be, the more likely it is to lodge in the heart of the people and the brains of the people that you're trying to um, reach. So we've got a few examples. So here we've got Shani. Um, first up, Here's a hero's journey. And what we're going to do is follow the story of Shani, who is a small business owner. And Shani faced, um, OK, we go. once upon a time, there was a small business owner named Shani. She faced numerous challenges in her entrepreneurial journey from financial struggles to fierce competition. But she was determined to succeed. So she embarked on her journey to learn, to adapt and to overcome obstacles. It took hard work, perseverance and a strong support network. And Shani transformed her business into a thriving enterprise. Her journey actually now inspires others. And she became a mentor for aspiring entrepreneurs, sharing her knowledge and empowering them to embark on their own heroic journeys. So what do you notice about that story? What, how did you feel? How does that make when I'm reading that out? How? How does that make you feel? I want you to make people feel something when you're presenting. At any point, by the way, if you want to add anything to our chat, add your thoughts on the stories, pop them in the chat and Tessa will um, engage with you. OK. So that's Shani. That's an idea of a hero's journey. We've taken that story from start to finish and, and, and hopefully provided a bit of inspiration there. The next kind of the next person I want you to meet is our friend Alex. So Alex is a passionate small business owner, but Alex is facing declining sales. Frustrated, he researched effective marketing strategies and discovered the power of social media. He recognized the problem and implemented a targeted social media campaign. He engaged customers and boosted brand awareness. And as a result, his business experienced a significant upswing in sales and customer engagement. By identifying the problem and implementing an innovative solution, Alex's small business regained its momentum and achieved sustainable growth. So with that story, the problem, we've identified Alex's problem and we've shown how Alex fix the problem. We've not said here's our solution or anything like as boldly. But hey, we're in the business of digital skills training. So hopefully the inspiration, some of you out in our audience today might be small business owners yourself. Some of you might recognize that problem of, 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 of declining sales or worry about where the sales are going to come. And it might be really useful and inspirational for you to hear that, you know, Social media helps other businesses. So, hey, you might be inspired and think, why can't it help mine? So there's your problem and there's our solution. And you can see how in that type of story, we've exposed the problem and then taken the story through to the solution to really open it up. And hopefully it'll be something that might resonate with different audiences. OK. Now. There's one more, OK, and this kind of story is um, all about relating to people. So in 
um, I start with, well, let's just go with the one we've got here. OK, so in the early days of my small business, I, fa I found myself struggling to balance work and family life. Long hours, mounting stress, and they took a toll on my well-being. One day I had an epiphany during a family holiday. I watched my kids play and laughed with my spouse. I realised the actual importance of finding harmony between my work and personal life. With renewed determination, I implemented a flexible schedule. I prioritised self-care and I delegated tasks. And this shift not only improved my relationships, but also enhanced my business productivity and success. So what I've just done is told a very relatable story. I've been quite vulnerable. I've told you a little about my problem, my issue, and, and showed um you know that I, I i'm not perfect i'm stood at the front talking to you but this is the issues that i might be going through so by using that personal anecdote by letting you feel empathy with me and then showing the pro the solution to the problem that i've exposed then it's actually combining a couple of them but by using that personal anecdote it really can help you to connect with your audience. Now, just um, uh, uh, one thing that's really helpful, actually, is that when you are delivering a presentation, you might want to present some facts. So absolutely key is to, when you're choosing your facts, use credible sources, because that's going to enhance your credibility and make your presentation more impactful. So think about the research you're going to do around your presentation, think up with some facts, maybe some statistics, and really use credible sources for these, okay? So authority, first of all, is there an authority, an expert on the topic? Do they have, what credentials or experience do they have that would make what they say useful to have? Look for those people when you're looking for somebody to quote, quote people who are an authority, not just some, you know, um, random message you wrote, you read on a forum, find the published authors, the credible sources and make sure you're accurate. Make sure the information is accurate. Um, maybe you can find several sources that say the same kind of thing. If you can corroborate your information, then you can be a lot more certain that what you're actually setting your stall out to say is going to be accurate. Be really, really careful um, to ensure that you check for bias. So look at the sources. Who have they been published by? Why would that pub person publish them? Is there a particular agenda? Does it have a point of view of the organisation or the individual? Make sure you don't just present other people's facts um, as the truth until you've had a good look and worked out why they're saying what they are saying which kind of leads into objectivity, you know, is the source objective? Are you presenting the issue fairly? Are you looking at the different sides of any particular issue? And how current, how up to date is it? Has it been recently updated? It's always important to be critical of the information that you find and, and cross check, just as if you, you would if you were a journalist. Um, in When it talks to journalists, a well-known journalistic um, publications could be a good source, but make sure sometimes they have pieces with a clear agenda in them. Um, you might look websites like uh, Statista, reliable and credible. Be careful about using blogs and things like Wikipedia as sources because anybody can write those things um, and they don't have that ri rigorous research and fact checking. And make sure that you do include your sources where possible, include your references. This is going to give you credibility and give that audience the chance to go away, do their own further reading and really buy into what you're saying. Um, and another thing that's not actually on this list, but currency and localization is really important. So try and find information that is local to the area that you're talking about, relevant to your audience. You know, if you found e-commerce numbers in India, that's not going to be so useful if your audience is here in the UK. Um, traffic patterns are going to be different in London than they are in York. So try wherever you can 
to be as relatable as possible, to, which really helps bring that content to life. Um, use visuals. Bring your content to life by using visuals. Try to make your presentation as absolute visual as possible using images, maps, uh, infographics. Um, using of a, the other thing to do is, is, is mix up the type of images that you use. Map after map after map after map, people are going to switch off. Bullet pointed list after bullet pointed list, people are going to switch off. By using different kinds of visuals for different slides, it's going to make those messages more impactful. Keep your infographics clear, keep them concise. Don't use too many unnecessary elements. Use great colours for them, make the colours stand out, make them clear. And make sure you reference the sources of any stats and numbers that you use. But you can see on this example, you know, using a couple of graphics is a lot easier on the eye than just writing the text on bullet points. So think of how you can bring it visually to life, and really engage the different brains that might be watching what you're up to. Um, a simple font is going to be easier for everybody to read. OK, don't make it hard for people to read. You know, simple fonts, good sized, visually appealing. Um, remember that the point of your presentation is to convey information. So prioritise readability. If you have lots of different kinds of fonts, if you have a very skinny font, like that, where the word that says invest on our second um, example here, different types of fonts can be quite clashing and jarring and not make much sense. You want consistency, you want simplicity, don't have lots of very frilly fonts that are actually difficult to read. I'd suggest, you know, use a, a couple of different types of font at, at best, at most rather. Um, and if you are going to use different styles, bold, italics, underlines, use them strategically. Use them to add in emphasis. Don't use them all over the place because they lose their impact when they use too often. And be careful not to overcomplicate the use when you're making these great infographics. Be very clear with your colours. Um, we recommend limiting your colour palette to no more really than three main colours. And make the colours complementary. Maybe have your main colour, your highlight, you know, your highlight colour, the main colour, then have a secondary highlight colour and a neutral colour. Make sure the colours contrast with each other. So the more contrast there is, the easier it is for people to understand and use some consistency. What I've got when I see the blue and the grey and the blue and the grey and the blue and the grey, and they're quite close together and it's three, I can see that they are grouped one blue and grey, two blue and grey, three blue and grey bars. And I can see that they relate to each other. I can see that they relate individually to the blues all relate to each other. The greys all relate to each other. And then as they are set pairs, maybe that's comparing quarter, this quarter with the same quarter last year, for example. And I can see what's going on. On our second example, where we've just used random colours, I don't immediately understand what those colours mean. It just looks like somebody's made a pretty rainbow. So think about what you can convey, how much information you can convey by using colours sparingly. Don't use too many colours, it just creates confusion. It gives you unnecessary information or your brain is looking for the extra information, whereas actually it's just been randomly assigned. OK, you want to be consistent. You want to make sure that your audience can pick out the information as quickly as possible. And here I think about hierarchy. Changing the size of elements changes the meaning. If you look at the second image there, I've got cappuccino, Americano and mocha. I don't know which is the best bestseller. I might think that they all sell about the same. Whereas the first image, my Americano is bigger, my cappuccino is middle sized, and then my mocha is smaller. It clearly shows which is the leader in that first place podium spot. Lovely graphic, you know, um, by using hierarchy. It's using hierarchy and the size of image. It's using an image that shows the hierarchy using the kind of metal podium. And also it's using a hierarchy in the size of the font it's using. So the most important thing, it's easy to tell which one it is. When it comes to your fonts and your headings, make sure 
good general rule is headings are the largest, then your subheadings, then the body text. It makes it easier for people to pick out um, what needs to be seen, what need they need to understand. And visit, you know, when you're using visuals, try and use to make sure that they are going to aid comprehension. Here we are, a list of international store locations. It's much easier to see the spread. We're not asking people to think where these countries are and see how widespread we are. I'm showing them with pins on a map just how much of the globe we are colouring. Um, if you've got place-based in information, maps are brilliant. Bar charts are great. Uh, diagrams, even photos of human faces, making the visuals as engaging as possible makes your presentation much easier. And we promised right at the beginning we mentioned visual accessibility. The clearer you can make your fonts, the better. The clearest font type for most people to read is a dark font on a light background with a good amount of contrast in there. Uh, make the fonts clear fonts, not wobbly fonts and, and make the make sure imagine that if you were stood at the back of the room can i read every word that's what you really want to be going for same when you're putting you know visuals here we've got our scent delivered and read it's very difficult to tell the difference between the three icons at the bottom whereas the three icons at the top they make it very clear the difference as you move through okay so that all said, let's go look away at how we can build your presentation, how you can take all those ideas of storytelling, all those ideas of some of the, the tips we've given for actually conveying your story and pull those together into a presentation. And the tool we're going to use is a tool called Google Slides. Now, Google Slides um, is a presentation editor. It lives within Google's workspace and it can be accessed at no charge. So there's three big ticks for it already. Now, the presentations live in the cloud, which means that lots of benefits doing that. You can access your presentations wherever you can get access to the Internet and log into your account. OK, and you can also have multiple people working on it. Anyone who you can you can send people the link and they can all log in. I'm I'm looking at this presentation right now. Tess is looking at it right now. Other people in our team could also be looking at it at the same time. So we can collaborate in real time and our work is always being backed up every few seconds. So you forget you if you've ever had that awful thing where you forget to hit the save button and then you lose all your work. That just isn't an issue anymore when things are saving up to the cloud as you go. And if somebody changes something and you don't like it, then you can use the revision history to go back to the version from three days ago, which you really liked and, and find that work that maybe has been changed since. And your great thing about the Google Slides is they can then be converted when you have worked on them together, collaborated. You can then uh, convert them out to different formats, something like a PowerPoint, something like a PDF. And you can edit PowerPoint presentations in them as well. So a really handy free of charge tool that anybody can use who's got and in the internet and an internet converted device, there is an app that goes on my phone and I can even um, uh, update presentations on the go. So the first thing you're going to do when you open it up, and it should feel quite familiar if you've ever used a spreadsheet or a, a, a document or a word, something like that, you should start to feel quite familiar. And you can customise how your presentation looks via themes. So the first thing I would do when I'm starting a new presentation is choose a theme. Then my colours are sorted. The fonts I want to use are sorted. Um, and I don't have to worry about arranging stuff. I can just go on and build that presentation and it will look and feel consistent. Um, you could even create your own custom theme for your business. Um, use your font, use your colours and create your own template using some recommended layout, which really helps if you're going to do a lot of presentations and you want to stay on brand. And we've spoken quite a lot about um, visuals and things, but there's uh, within Google Slides, there are lots of different tools that work with your Google Slides. These are called extensions. So with um, 
extensions, you can find all kinds of add-ons. So you can bring in icons, you can uh, bring in fonts, you can bring in charts from Google Sheets. Lots of, if you go to extensions, lots um, of, of, of different tools you can bring in to enhance your presentations. You can use translations in Translate My Slide. You might want to use music or polls. Lots of tools out there to help you. Um, so with those polls, uh, keeps your audience engaged. You can integrate a tool like Slido or Mentimeter into your slide. Then you can run live quizzes, live polls, live Q&A. Um, you could even make things competitive with a little leaderboard as you go. So if you're looking for um, some inspiration, um, oh, you can access all, sorry, first of all, you can access those extensions from, there's an extensions button in your toolbar. That's how you go about finding those things. Um, and if you want to see what's out there, go to explore. Um, the explore feature is under tools and you can search the web, search images, or even pull content directly from your drive um, to really help you uh, make that presentation sparkle. Loads of features, loads of tools, but these are some that might be really good to get you going. Something that, you know, tonight you joined me because you there's something to do with building of engaging presentations that made you want to come and see it. Think about that, the title of your presentation. How can you make it as impactful as grab the attention? of your audience? How are you going to set the tone for the entire presentation? Create presentations that wow is much nicer than make good presentations. Imagine that somebody's reading a brochure. Maybe you're, if you're delivering this presentation in person, what's, what can you do? How can you make it so the title leaps out of the page amongst all the other presentations they might go to? and make them excited and set the tone for what they're going to get when they do the bread. Make your title concise, think about making it memorable. Um, think about using strong, even provocative language to generate that interest, capture the attention so that it leaps off the page. Imagine you're writing a social media post with it. How are you going to make it so that thumb stops scrolling? It's exactly the same sort of thing. You want to grab that attention in the moment. And we've mentioned it already, but use less text. The little, too much text can be overwhelming on a slide. It distracts from what you're saying. If, you're, if, if your audience is trying to read every word that's on the slide, then they're not listening and absorbing what you're saying. Okay. So a few top tips for you, you know, consider the number of slides using, you use, there's no magic number. But I would always think that if I had a 10 minute presentation, then maybe 10 minutes, 10 slides would be a good rule of thumb. 20 minutes presentation, no more than 20 slides. Try to limit your number of, of, of slides to uh, no more than the presentation minutes. I have de delivered a half an hour um, presentation in the past with three slides, you know, and one of those was a title slide. So it depends what you're conveying. It depends how you want to tell the story. I tend to use my slides more than anything else to remind me what to say next. It helps keep me on track, which when we're thinking about presentation skills is really very important. If you're going to use bullet points, great to do. Don't, you know, use few, less text. Keep those bullet points concise. Think about your font and think about changing it up both changing the visuals, but changing the plate pace. Sometimes some of the slides I've just gone, bam, there's the slide, there's your point of information, off you bob. Sometimes I've popped up a slide and taken a bit longer to talk it through. You keep it interesting if you're varying the pace, varying the type of content. Um, you know, it's all about making sure that you create that you really get time to explore a concept, that you really get time to deliver and change things up and make it so it is interesting and impactful. A few things to take in on note if you're running that presentation in an online way, because when you're delivering a, a session remotely, in some ways, some people find it a lot easier because it's just me talking to myself or just me talking to one person on the other end of my computer screen. But I can't see you. I can't see your body language. I can't make eye contact with you. So how do I know? How can I reflect how you're feeling? Um, so really think about, you know, 
how that is going to differ to standing in front of a room full of people. Are you going to be able to share your screen? There's there's, there's different ways of, of, of setting up an online presentation. Lots of different tools. As I say, we've gone with YouTube because it's super easy for people to access. You just click on a link and you go to YouTube and it's easy for you. It's actually quite hard for us behind the scenes. There's lots of technical things that could go wrong and sometimes do. And we can't have you on screen. I can't see your lovely faces because there's no video available for participants. If I've got 100 people, I might not want that. But if I'm delivering to a smaller audience, I might absolutely want to see their faces. So I don't feel like I'm talking to myself. So think of different, you know, ways. How are you going to get the audience participating? It's why I keep saying, don't forget to talk to Tessa, because that's the way that you can feel engaged. You can feel like your voice is heard, that there's lots of things for you to do. I've mentioned already ease of use. I would always suggest that, you know, you make it as easy for your audience to join as possible. So by choosing to learn the tools that they're most familiar with is a really good way of doing that be as easy as possible for them to join quite often means there might be more technically for you to do so have a few dry runs make sure you know what to do when things go wrong we literally have an oops sorry there's been a technical problem slide that one of us can pop on if if something bad happens you know if something goes wrong because things do go wrong so you've got to learn to kind of roll with those as well and think about the cost there's different um uh, resources that you might need um, might be better lighting to make your presentation look better. It might be a paid subscription to the particular platform, you know, something like a Zoom. You can use a certain amount of time for free, but then maybe you need to pay for longer. So consider how you're going to, um, what you're going to need. Are you going to need a presentation tool like Slido that maybe has a cost to it? And there are some tools that do have various levels of cost because Google Slides isn't the only tool you might want to use. And um, we've got some other examples here. Prezi, which um, is great for animations and making things move really swiftly and smoothly through, but does come with a cost. Canva is what we would call a, a freemium product. So it starts for free and then there's um, levels of premium beyond it, but actually it's got some great tools, some great templates. You can use it to craft your presentation and um, deliver it online and then use the same brand elements across all your social media posts, for example. Um, Visme is another, just three examples for you. There are lots of options out there. They do come with varying costs. So it's all about doing the research and looking into which ones are going to work best for you. Okay then, right. Whew, that's the technical stuff done. Okay. What I want to think about, I'll just have a quick check in with Tessa, see everything's going all right. Yep, yeah, she looks like she's happy as can be, which is nice. Tessa is a, a generally quite chill, quite happy kind of person. Um, but do ask her, you've got about another 10 or so minutes to ask as many questions of her as you would like. Whilst I take you through um, some tips on how you can be the best presenter that you can be, okay? And we've mentioned audience quite a lot, all right? So think about the people you're delivering to. Think about their needs. Think about how many of them there are. Think about the space you're presenting in, you know? It's all about adapting you, your style, your um, the way you deliver your presentation to actually what the needs of that audience are. I deliver this presentation all kinds of different times and places. I've delivered it to a room full of um, dentists and a room full of business people and a room full of students. And I'll actually try and change it up each time I do. Because how I would present, how one group would want me to present to them will be different to the way that the other group would understand me. So really start thinking, how are you going to adapt to your audience? Um, the good news is that, you know, you are, no matter how big the crowd is, 
it's still just made up of individuals. So if you can have a conversation with one pe person, you can absolutely present to more than one. And if you can make your topic make sense for an individual, sure as sure, but you can make it make sense to more people. OK, it's a little bit different when you present online, because as I've said already, it's it's just me and you here. It's very intimate. We could have hundreds of people logging into this broadcast or it might just be me and you. So it can be feel a lot more intimate. It can feel a lot more one to one, actually. So what I tend to do is just try and um, imagine that it is just me and you here. I am just delivering to one person and I'll try and make it make as much sense to you as I possibly can. Um, when you're trying to adapt to your audience, that's when interaction and engagement can come in. So maybe asking for feedback, maybe asking for a bit of participation, maybe using tools like Slido, which what is one of those poll tools to get some of that feedback, to get some of that participation. Um, really handy when you're doing both face to face and um, online presentations, actually. But it's going to help you to engage with that audience. <clears throat> so engaging with the audience, getting them to present to um, participate with you. Lots of do's and don'ts out there. I love audience participation. Some people get scared of it, but absolutely, the more you can inspire your audience to participate, the more you can get that ongoing feedback as to how you're doing and embrace it and use it as a way to improve rather than being scared of it. OK, so no matter how large or small your audience is, there's ways you cannot get them to um, interact. One of the great ways of doing it, and I've been doing it as we go through, is asking questions. I'll ask you a question, you know. Now, if you've got a really big group of people, asking them a question or expecting them to ask you a question can be really quite difficult because that one person stand, may be nervous standing up in front of all those people to ask a question. But you can drive participation in a big group by things like show of hands who loves Beyonce. OK, and you and the other thing, do you see what I did there? I said, show me your hand if and I put my hand up, show of hands if. And what I'm doing is I am giving the audience permission. I'm telling them what I want them to do and I'm demonstrating it. So actually using my body to physically show them what I'm expecting makes it easier for them to relate. So if you get that kind of hushed silence, maybe try a physical gesture. It means they don't have to verbalise. They don't have to click their brain around and thinking about how to respond. I'm just showing them exactly what to do. OK, it might be if you've got a group, a smaller group or maybe a medium sized group that you can see there's a couple of people who seem to be nodding along with you, and really engaging with you. If I, if we were doing this online, you know, um, I've got Sadama who wants to learn more to help with their knowledge. and I'm going to call you out by name, Sadama. So I'm hoping I'm saying your name right. I'm going to ask you directly a question myself. You know, I'm going to. Um, maybe ask you for your thoughts on a particular topic and by calling out by name by acknowledging that you're there I might in a big group in a group you know just if I see somebody nodding along and going along with it I might ask them what they think and hopefully they might have the confidence to jump in when it comes to questions I love getting questions I'll always thank somebody for their question even if I can't think of the answer straight away because it shows they're engaged, it shows they're listening, and it also shows where the understanding is falling or falling down, maybe. And I can follow up with a question, even if I don't know the answer straight away. I don't have to know the answers to all questions. And when you get questions, sometimes the questions, this is what I'm talking about, and the questions might go off this way. I'll always say, OK, I'll be appreciative of the question, and I'll say, all right, maybe that's not right for this for just right now, sometimes I'll say, hopefully you'll get that answer in the next section because we're coming on to that. But if you don't get the answer, remind me at the game at the end and we'll, we'll have a conversation offline. You know, you can look at ways of being very appreciative of the questions, but not letting them divert you. And make sure that you're really listening. OK, and a great way to give yourself time if somebody asks a question as well as showing you're listening by nodding and, and, and making eye contact with them as they're doing it. 
repeat the question back. Repeating the question back, acknowledging it, repeating it back does a few things. One, it means that everybody who maybe didn't hear that question themselves the first time, it means that they get to hear what the question is. But the magic thing it's doing is giving your brain a chance to catch up and formulate your answer. So as you're responding, as you're reading back, the, you know, saying back the question to them, they can make sure, acknowledge that you get that, get it right, that that is what they asked. But also it gives your brain a bit of time to think up your answer for you. Be very careful about overloading content, you know, try and tailor the story so it's giving value to the audience that you're talking about. Um, as I say, I will adapt the way I deliver depending on who's in my audience. If I had an international audience tonight, which I know I do, I will try and use maybe some in international examples. If I knew you were all from the same place, then I'd try and bring in some local, local story, local flavour to it. Here it says focus. So one of the hardest things people find is that they were going to forget what they want to say. So each time a slide comes up, if you know one, two, maximum of three things that you want to say for that slide, if you can just remember those few things, maybe there's a hint on the slide. Then, then as you get talking, you say your first couple of things, remember those things, it's going to help you to remember your entire presentation, okay? Then you don't have to rely on reading the slide, you don't have to rely on your memory too much, um, and, and you can also make sure that you get those key things out. But the keyest of key points is to pause. If you're worried about forgetting, if you're worried about gabbling on, people don't understand you because you're talking so quick. Pause. Give. Take a breath. Every time a new side comes up, don't panic that I don't know what to say. Pause. Breathe. Relax. Get air into my brain, air into my lungs, which pushes the blood around the body, gets the heart pumping. Take a breath. And give yourself a chance to recall what you actually, those three things you wanted to say. What the breath and the pause actually does, though, it's not just about allowing you to catch up. It allows your audience's brains to catch up as well. Your pause gives you time to recall what you need to say, gives your audience time to finish processing what you've just said and realise we're going on to something next. So pauses are really important, both from slide to slide. You'll notice when we structured our presentations, we do them in three sections and we take each section and each one has a coloured slide that says section one, section two, section three. And that gives everybody time to finish. Right. I'm done with that part. We're going on to this part. We take a pause and it's really helpful. And while we're pausing, we might decide what we're going to think about for our voice. So your voice is a real powerful tool. And actually, one of the, we say volume here, being really loud is not very comfortable. It won't be loud, it won't be comfortable on your throat, it won't be comfortable on your audience, they might switch off to that. The most important thing, if I want to highlight and really emphasise a point, I don't go louder, I might actually go quieter. I force people to lean in to listen, as long as it can actually be heard. So tailor your voice. If I'm delivering to a room of 100 people, I'm going to have to use a bit of protection or a microphone to make sure they can hear. But in a smaller room, that would just feel weird if I'm big projecting. So use your voice as a tool. Change the style, adapt the style to the different people in the room. Think about your subject. If I'm presenting on something very serious, I'm, I'm going to use my voice in a way that conveys that weight, that gravity. If I'm presenting something more lighthearted, I might change the way I talk, the tone of my voice. If I get really excited about something, it gets a bit quicker. If I want something really important, I've taken the tone down. I'm adding more pauses and I'm giving people time to feel the weight of the words I'm saying. It's a really good point to mention as well. We use sounds to fill silence. Try and stop doing it. Most people do it. We go, um, or, uh, or well, like, thing, that, erg. We add words in. 
try and let the silence into your voice, into your presentations. If you don't have to say something, don't say anything. It can really help the clarity and it will help how composed you look. If we're saying, uh, mm, all the time, then it really starts to make us sound like we don't know what we're talking about. Pace wise, you can maintain a steady pace, but you might have to move quicker as you either get to the end of your presentation and you realize that we're about to run out of time. And I still want to talk to you about body language because body language plays a huge role in communication. It communicates, our body language communicates what other people are, to other people, what we want them to do. But we can actually use our body language to communicate to ourselves. OK, so if I were feeling a bit nervous, what I want to do is create a positive body shape and actually use that positive body shape to convince my brain that I am confident. If you think about all the negative emotions, if we don't want to be here, we shrink in on ourselves, we become smaller, our heads go down, our voice goes down to the floor. If I roll my shoulders back, open up my body and speak forwards, make eye contact, I suddenly look a lot more confident. It's in the shoulders, it's in the hips, it's in the stance. Power posing, if you want to convince your body that you do feel confident, then adopt a powerful pose, feet apart, hands on hips, strong strong stance, strong eye contact. Stand like that for two minutes. Jump up now from wherever you're doing, unless you're on a train or something. Jump up, strike that pose. Stay there for a couple of minutes. Your heart starts pumping. The oxygen gets better to your brain. It kicks off cortisol and te testosterone. It gets these really po positive emotions coursing through your body. You'll feel stronger. You'll feel more confident and you'll feel more able to deliver what you need to do. Hopefully now you start to feel ready to take on the word. So make sure that you're mindful of how you move, make sure of how you stand and try and connect with your audience. Think about your bad habits. How are you going to get rid of those ums, get rid of those ahs and make it so that you can um, really connect with that audience. The most important thing to do is your homework for tonight is to set some side time aside to practice delivering a presentation. OK, record it. Nobody else ever needs to see it. And assess for yourself. When I watch this back, what am I doing? Am I moving too much? Am I saying um too much? Am I pausing? Am I gabbling? Pick out something that you do really well and something you'd like to improve upon. And then for next time make it better. Okay. Great presenters are, no, are made. They are not born. You can build on whatever natural skills you've got to make yourself a better presenter, just like you would with any other skill. It takes deliberate practice. So best way to do it is to record yourself and watch yourself back. Watch yourself back without the sound off. Watch yourself back in slow mo in in quick motion. If I watch on fast forward, I probably can move like this a lot all the time because I move with my body. Think about it. Have a look at it. OK, so that's your homework for the evening. I'm so sorry. I know Tessa will have answered your questions as we go on through. We've completely smashed through the time because I do get you might have guessed a little bit excited and passionate about this um, topic. What we would love is for your feedback. So if you've got a, a phone handy, snap this QR code with your QR code reader, or I'll ask um, Tessa to pop this short code or feedback code into the chat for you right now, and you'll be able to come along and give us feedback later. If you want to carry on learning in your own time, check out the Google Digital Garage website. We're available 24-7 to you. You can rewatch tonight's video if there's anything that you think, yep, that was what it was. That's what I wanted to do. Um, and yeah, you can keep learning with the Google Digital Garage by coming back for more live webinars. If you're here in the UK, check out the schedule because we might even be coming to a town near you sometime soon. Anyway, but as it is, my apologies, my sincere apologies for running over tonight. Hope you managed to stay with me till the end. Um, if you learn, want to learn more, 
from Google Digital Garage, please do come back. Otherwise, thank you for joining me tonight. We look forward to welcoming you to another Google Digital Garage training session sometime soon. Have a lovely evening.